This is Ben Summers with Adagio, and I thought it would be helpful to provide a brief demonstration of our risk adjusted performance calculator. So uh, you see here the instruction page. Uh, this is where uh, you'll land uh, when you uh, access the calculator. And while it's tempting to uh, gloss over uh, all this text, I think the purpose is worth highlighting. So most investors only consider one variable when determining how to choose an investment, possible return, which explains the success of the lottery as a business model. But this approach, admittedly, in addition to other factors, is what leads to the big financial firms of Wall Street growing more and more profitable at the expense of the investing public or retail investors. To meaningfully evaluate an investment, you must take into account and measure the risk as well as the return. This calculator employs every major risk-adjusted performance metric used by the most sophisticated financial firms over an effectively complete market cycle to analyze any investment you choose. The outputs will allow you to clearly and objectively rank any and every investment option at your disposal with the most thorough and accurate analysis available. This calculator is designed to accommodate investors of every level, outputting a simple color code for novices uh, and a comprehensive set of metric calculations for financial professionals. Note that liquidity, tax consequences, and other considerations must also be taken into account with respect to your individual circumstances to determine the suitability of any investment you choose. Um, and below under the references, uh, you'll see these are the links to the source data. And uh, this link here uh, is a reference to a presentation uh, that does a fairly good job of uh, explaining how to price private businesses, private securities, private assets. And so uh, it, it's this um, uh, presentation from NYU uh, that is the source material for the calculation of the illiquidity premium in addition to a few others. So when we go to the calculator itself, you see at the top is a, uh, an illustration of the mathematical syntax of some of the basic um, metrics, beta, geometric mean, which is average, uh, capital asset pricing model, alpha, and the sharp ratio. Um, so one of the first things uh, that we might do is click on this Your Investment button which allows you to name the investment or the portfolio that you're analyzing. So in this case, uh, the default is to have the MSCI US REIT index um, loaded in the uh, input for the subject uh, asset being analyzed. And so we'll just go ahead and uh, input that name, MSCI US REIT, um, click change. And here you see the, uh, the name has changed. Um, you'll notice this is the same data uh, from the read index that is in here by default. Um, we'll come back and change this in a little bit, but uh, for now, uh, let's just take a look at the analysis. Um, note that we start at 2007. Um, for the data to be meaningful, uh, we need a minimum of one complete market cycles worth of data, and that's a minimum, the more the better. Uh, we can go back here to 2004 as the first year. Uh, the reason for that is 2004 was the first year that the MSCI US Read Index came into existence and began reporting. So um, we have a look at the annual returns here. Uh, we click calculate. Uh, these calculations are already done uh, by default. Um, you'll see these numbers match as you would expect. Um, so the average return or expected return, those terms are used synonymously uh, for the S&P 500 is 8.69%. And the average or expected return that's expressed as geometric mean for the MSCI read index is US read index is 9.18. So um, if we go over here to this top uh, area, the performance summary, this is the uh, summarized and most simply uh, simple output uh, for uh, people to have a look at the overview of a given asset or portfolio. So here we see the risk-free rate of return. That's the 10-year treasury as of uh, right now, which is uh, November 21st, 2018 at around 7.20 p.m.
Um, we have the average return of the index, which is what we were analyzing, uh, the market risk of the index, uh, the maximum potential loss of the index as historically measured going back to 2004, and the uh, return of the index after removing the market risk and the risk-free rate of return. So we get a 1.34% uh, return. So um, for those who don't like to see numbers at all, uh, we do have a color-coded output here. So here we have a, uh, a, a medium orange color, an orange color, uh, which falls halfway between poor and good, which means it's probably, eh, it's okay. <laughs> not, it's not good, but it's not terrible. It's probably okay um, if we want to take a, a less numerical uh, look. Um, below that summary section, we have each constituent characteristic uh, that really paints a complete picture of the asset or portfolio being analyzed. So the top row here, we've got the risk-free rate. We saw that uh, here as well, 3.06%. That's the 10-year. Uh, the expected market return, that's the average return of the S&P 500, 8.69, which we see there. Um, the expected or average return, average return of the asset or uh, portfolio we're looking at, here it's the U.S. Uh, uh, U.S. read index, like we saw earlier, 9.18. Uh, the standard deviation of the subject is 20.46%. Um, uh, the beta is 0.848, which uh, tracks very, which means it tracks very closely to the S&P, uh, as you can see in the chart down here. Uh, the blue is the S&P, um, and then we normally have dark blue, the MSCI U.S. read index charted but since our subject data is the same as this data uh, the orange just overlaps this blue so we see that um, as the numbers dictate uh, it tracks fairly closely to the s p so what that tells us is reits aren't necessarily a very good tool for diversification um, continuing further we have the output of the capital asset pricing model labeled uh, e sub ri uh, that's 7.84 percent that means for the index to be a good investment, the sort of the break-even number, so to speak, it should yield 7.84%. And uh, going back to 2004, it's done slightly better than that. So uh, there is a little bit of alpha there, um, which is the next row, 1.34% alpha. Um, that's the return that we generate above uh, the risk adjustment, uh, you might say. Um, or at least the market risk adjustment. <clears throat> Below alpha, we've got uh, just the risk premium. That's the expected return minus the risk-free rate. Um, then we have the excess return to uh, the risk-free rate, uh, which is uh, 6.11. Obviously, you get that from the, subtracting the average from the risk-free rate here. Um, and you'll see the calculations are defined next to the uh, description. Um, sharp ratio, which tells us the difference between the expected or average performance and the risk-free rate divided by the standard deviation is 0 0.299, a 0 0.3. Um, that's not great. Um, I think a sharp ratio of one uh, is sort of the, the beginning of good, as I would define it. Um, Standard deviation of the S&P is 16.21%, which is less than the standard deviation of the read index. The lower the standard deviation, uh, in general, the better. Um, Medigliani measure, which I particularly like, it encompasses both market risk and total risk, is 7.91. The higher that number, the better. Also, what's nice about Medigliani is the output is a percentage, so it's an intuitive output. Uh, the higher the return, it's uh, you can think of it as the scaled uh, return uh, based upon total risk, uh, again, which is it's intuitive and it's uh, fairly comprehensive in what it tells you. Uh, the sum of the returns to the positive side, meaning above the expected return, is 131.54%. The sum of the returns below the expected return is negative 83.92. Uh, those two work together to give us omega, we'll see shortly. Um, Standard deviation of the, nail, the downside below the expected return is 13.21%, which uh, is used in this next metric, the Sortino ratio, 
One of the criticisms of the Sharpe ratio is that it takes into account total standard deviation, which means you get penalized for movement to the upside. Well, movement to the upside is generally a good thing. We want to see increases in returns. Um, so to more accurately capture that picture, uh, the Sortino ratio was developed where you only account for uh, downside standard deviation. And so I would argue that the Sortino ratio is a more meaningful um, metric than Sharp. And you'll see with that, uh, the Sortino ratio is lower than Sharp. So in this particular case, it looks like the Sharp ratio paints a slightly overly optimistic picture um, when you uh, look at uh, the downside in particular. Omega ratio uh, looks at the total upside uh, divided by the total downside. Uh, I like that metric because it ca captures all four statistical moments uh, for the quants out there. Um, it, uh, the higher this ratio, obviously, uh, the better. Um, here we have uh, the maximum annual return we've experienced over that uh, period is 35.92%. The minimum is negative 3797 uh, The portfolio's maximum drawdown, which uh, tells you uh, effectively what to expect the worst case scenario to be in a down market. Uh, in this particular case, we're capturing the 2008 down market, which is about as bad as we've ever seen. Uh, you're looking at about a 50% a drawdown, 48.4, which is substantial. Uh, that's arguably one of the most important considerations when looking at an asset. It's what's my potential downside. And um, again, this, again, very important metric. And in this particular case, it is substantial. ROMAD, the average return or expected return over maximum drawdown, the higher that number, the better. 0.19 is not great. Uh, trainer ratio looks at the expected return minus the risk-free rate uh, relative to beta, its correlation. I don't pay a lot of attention to trainer, but there are people that do. And so here it is, 0.072%. Um, information ratio uh, looks at the expected return relative to uh, the market or less the market uh, divided by uh, the standard deviation. And there we are at 0.024. I don't pay a lot of attention to the information ratio either, but it's there for those who do. Um, and then we get into R squared. So the components of R squared are the sum of the regression line error squared, uh, in this case, 29.93, and the sum of error from uh, RI squared, uh, which is 55.04. Of course, RI is the expected return of the asset or portfolio. And then we get R squared, which is 45.59% which tells you that a great, um, a significant amount of the performance is attributable simply to the market, which tells us to what extent uh, this asset or portfolio is diversified or is um, dependent upon the market as a whole. So that's a look at the metrics. Um, to change the inputs, um, we simply click on uh, the uh, input uh, box and put in the number. I'm going to just go ahead and retype in the REIT index and we can go in, hit return. If you hit return, instead of clicking on the box, it just highlights the box. You can type over it. Um, you can also tab, which will serve the same function as pressing return. Um, and again, just type in the annual returns for your portfolio or your asset, uh, stock, um, what have you, real, real property, whatever, has an annual average return as a percentage can be analyzed. And then finally, um, which I think is also ex extremely valuable, is the ability to calculate the illiquidity premium for private security. So if this MSCI US read index was captured uh, under a private fund, then uh, we click private security. And below this set of metrics we went over are three additional metrics, which are very important. Um, it is the illiquidity premium which is the premium that you would expect to see in performance in exchange for the lack of liquidity, the inability to dispose of the asset at will. And then that Lambda gets worked into um, the capital asset pricing model to give you the expected return um, adjusting for illiquidity. So here we saw the output of the capital asset pricing model was 7.84%. That's what the asset should yield as sort of a break-even return given the risk you're taking on, uh, particularly the market risk that you're taking on. Here is the break-even point taking into account both the market risk and the illiquidity. So 
it sh as you would expect, the asset should pay a higher premium, a higher return by virtue of being illiquid compared to a publicly traded counterpart. But it's also worth noting that that uh, premium is not nearly as high as you might expect or you might find uh, be priced at your typical uh, broker dealer or investment advisory firm. And then finally, we have alpha lambda, which is the alpha, the excess return relative to uh, not, not only the risk, but the illiquidity borne. So uh, this is just alpha also accounting for liquidity. So if we if it was a publicly traded asset, we'd look at alpha and here it is 1.34. Uh, the alpha doesn't really change uh, in this particular case. So um, <clears throat> the alpha uh, lambda doesn't change uh, very much in this particular case. So um, there you have it. Um, this is the risk adjusted performance calculator. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at solutions at adagioLLC.com uh, or feel free to schedule a call on my calendar at calendly.com slash bsummers. I look forward to working with you.